Shalom, Yashrallah, this is your brother Uriel, coming back at you with another lesson. I'd like to first start off by giving all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahashim, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai. That's all praises to the Father in the name of the only, be only begotten Son, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ. So today's lesson, uh, I'm going to be going over salvation. Uh, what is salvation? Who it's for? Why is salvation necessary? So I'm going to start off by... Uh, just getting straight to it. I'm going to start off by giving the definition of salvation uh, just through Google search. And uh, the first uh, definition through salvation, it says, Preservation or deliverance from harm, ruin, or loss. The second uh, definition is deliverance from sin and its consequences believed by Christians to be brought about by faith in Christ, in Hamashiach, Yahawashai, and that's what we're going to be touching on, more importantly, is the second definition, um, deliverance from sin. So in the Compact Bible Dictionary, let's get that real quick, what the Compact Bible Dictionary, uh, I'm going to read a part of it, because salvation in this is, is, is real lengthy, really lengthy, so we're just going to touch on the first, uh, essentially the first paragraph. So this is salvation in the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary, and it reads, not necessarily a technical theological term, Salakia, not necessarily a technical or theological term, but simply denotes deliverance from almost any kind of evil, whether material or spiritual. Theologically, however, it denotes the whole process by which, by which man is delivered from all that interferes with the enjoyment of God's highest blessings. The actual enjoyment of those blessings, the root idea in salvation is deliverance from some danger or evil. And that is uh, the gist of what salvation is, is to be delivered from harm, danger, or evil. So we have to understand what salvation is. So that's the definition of it, but who is it for? Who was it given to? So I'm going to start off by reading the uh, book of 1 John. Because it says to deliver from sin or danger or harm. So let's see what sin is. So this is the book of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. And it reads, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So here it is. The Bible's telling us that sin is the transgression of the law, statutes, and commandments. Whose laws? The Most High God's laws that he gave to the children of Israel. So sin is breaking of God's laws, transgressing his laws. So let me get the book of Romans, chapter 4, and verse 15. And it reads, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So the law was given as a mirror to point out the sin that is within us. So it says, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So if there is no law instituted or mandated, then there is no sin. But there is law, so our people are in sin. And this is what the Bible is telling us. So I'm going to go to the next chapter, Romans 5, verse 13. This is the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 13, and it reads, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed, Imputed, Salakia, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. In other words, there is no consequences for sin if there is no law. But there is consequences if there is law. Sin is imputed because of the breaking of God's laws. Or Salakia, the law was imputed before the breaking of God's laws. That's what it is, imputed for breaking God's laws. So that's what we have to understand. Where there is no law, there is no sin. But there is law, and the law points out the sin that is within us. So who was the law given to? Because Christianity in the, in the world would have you to think that the laws of God was given to everybody. Yes, there is universal law, like child sacrifice, adultery, homosexuality. These are universal laws for everybody. But there's the Mosaic law that was given to a certain group of people. So let's, let's get that real quick. This is the book of Psalms, 147, verse 19 and 20. Because remember, it says, where there is no law, there is no sin. 
So this is the book of Psalm 147, 19 and 20. It says, He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. You see that? So the, the Lord says he gave the, the black, Hispanic, and Native Americans, who are the children of Israel, the law, statutes, and commandments. He said he gave it to them because Jacob and Israel are the same person predicated on Genesis 32 and 28 and Genesis 35 and verse 10. Jacob's name was renamed to Israel. So anytime you read Jacob or Israel, it's one and the same. So the Bible says he showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. Verse 20, he hath not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. So, like the Bible says, where there is no law, there is no sin. Okay? So, the law was given to the Israelites, which means that the Israelites are in sin for breaking God's laws. So, let me get the book of Psalms 50 and 16 to expound that it was given to Israel only. So, this is Psalms 50 and 16. But unto the wicked, God saith, unto these other nations, chiefly Esau, but to all these other nations, but unto the wicked, God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? So the Lord is presenting the question. He said, what do these other nations have to do with his word? Why are they upholding his word and saying it's for them? The Bible says it's not for them. Let me read that again. Psalm 50, 16. But unto the wicked God saith, you see that? The most high God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Why are you, why are you declaring the law, statutes, and commandments that I gave to the children of Israel, God is asking? It says, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. You see that? The covenants were never given to all these other nations. They were given to the children of Israel. And we're going to go over that in just a second. So, it says, to these other nations, why are they taking the laws and, and, and claiming it to, the, to, to themselves? It's not for them. So let me get the book of Tobit. This is the book of Tobit, chapter 4 and verse 19. And it reads, Bless the Lord thy God always, and desire of him that thy ways may be directed, and that all thy paths and counsel may prosper for every nation hath not counsel you see that so the lord is telling us uh uh through the prophet uh tobit here he's saying uh why are these other people thinking that they have counsel because they don't have counsel the counsel was always given to the children of israel let me let me start from the top again tobit 4 19 and it reads bless the lord thy god always and desire of him that thy ways may be directed, and that all thy paths and counsel may prosper, for every nation hath not counsel, but the Lord himself giveth, giveth all good things, and he humbleth who he will, as he will. Now therefore, my son, remember my commandments, neither let them be put out of thy mind. You see that? So how do we know? That this is regarded to the children of Israel because the commandments were given to the children of Israel as we just went over. The law, statutes, and commandments. And as for these other nations, they have not known them. So it says these other nations don't have the counsel of the Lord. Okay? The children of Israel do. So let me get the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 4. And I'm going to start at verse 44. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and 44. I'm going to read down to 45, and it reads, And this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel. You see that? It says the children of Israel received the law. Verse 45, These are the testimonies, in the statutes, in the judgments, which Moses spake unto the children of Israel after they came forth out of Egypt. You see that? We were the ones that were delivered out of the hands of Pharaoh out of the land of Egypt. It wasn't all nations. It was the nation of Israel. So here it is. It's saying that Israel received the law, statutes, and commandments. So let me validate that even further. So I'm going to get Exodus 24, and I'm going to start at verse 3. This is the book of Exodus 24, starting at verse 3. 
And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord had said will we do. So the people agreed to keep the law, statutes, and commandments. Verse 4, Exodus 24, verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built it an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. You see that? Not according to Edom, not according to Moab, not according to Ishmael and Ammon, okay, and all the tribes of Ham. No, the Bible says 12 pillars of the tribes of Israel. Verse 5, And he sent young men of, of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. Verse 6, And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Verse 7, And he took the book of the covenant, and read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord had said, we will do and be obedient. You see that? That is so important to understand because the covenant was given to the children of Israel. The children of Israel agreed to keep the law, statutes, and commandment by blood sacrifice. This was the agreement between the Most High God and the children of Israel. So let me get the book of Baruch. Get the book of Baruch, chapter 1, and I'm going to start at verse 19. This is the book of Baruch, chapter 1, verses 19 through 22, and it reads, Since the day that the Lord brought our forefathers out of the land of Egypt unto this present day, we have been disobedient unto the Lord our God, and we have been negligent in not hearing his voice. You see that? Since he delivered us out of the land of Egypt, we agreed to the covenant, but we have broken the covenant. We haven't been obedient or honored what we said. Remember, we said all that the Lord has said, we will do. But here it is. Since, since we came out of the land of Egypt, we haven't honored our oath, what we agreed to, the covenant. Baruch 1 and 20. Wherefore, the evils cleaved unto us in the curse which the Lord appointed by Moses, his servant, at the time that he brought our fathers out of the land of Egypt to give us a land that floweth with milk and honey, like as it is to see this day. OK, and that milk and honey, that's just going into the laws, the wisdom, knowledge and understanding. OK, it says, wherefore the evils cleaved unto us. Why? Because we did not uphold our agreement. We broke the covenant. We we're continuing to break the laws of God. And this is why our people today, to this present day, are still under the curses. Verse 21, Baruch 1 and 21. Nevertheless, we have not hearkened unto the voice of the Lord our God, according unto all the words of the prophets whom he sent unto us. You see that? Nahum, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Joel, Obadiah, all the prophets, Matthew, okay, Peter, all the prophets that the Most High God has sent to the children of Israel to give us the words of life, to bring us back to the Father and to his Son. And he sent his Son to deliver us. We're going to get, touch on that in just a minute. Let me read verse 21 again, Baruch 1 and 21. Nevertheless, we have not hearkened unto the voice of the Lord our God, according unto all the words of the prophets whom he sent unto us. You see that? Our people have neglected to hear the voice of the Lord through his prophets, even to this day. You got brothers coming out to these street corners, bringing out the words of life, telling the people to repent, to turn from the ways of evil. But here it is, they're shunning them, giving them the, 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 the shoulder, chucking up the deuces, flipping them off, spitting at them. Okay, everything is being repeated. The times of old are still today. Okay, nothing has changed. Verse 22, Baruch 1 and verse 22, and it reads, But every man followed the imagination of his own wicked hearts, which is the mind. It says, To serve strange gods and to do evil in the sight of the Lord our God. You see that? Our people went off. They went into idolatry. Okay? They completely forsook 
our creator. And it's, and it's still the same to this day. Okay? This is why it says, sin is the transgression of breaking God's laws. We agreed to those laws as a people, but here it is. We're breaking them still to this day. So let me get the book of Amos. Amos chapter 3. You know, and this is... This is a classic, but it's so profound. You can't go over this enough. This is Amos chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, and it reads, Hear this word that the Lord have spoken against you, O children of Israel. You see that? He didn't say, O children of Moab, of Ishmael, of Edom, of Ammon, of Cush. He didn't say, O children of all the people on the inhabited earth. No, he said, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you. O children of Israel, the 12 tribes, says, against the whole family, which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. You see that? He said, out of all the families of the earth that he's created, he said, you only have I known, you so-called black, Hispanic, and Native Americans, the true biblical Israelites. And because we are the only people that he knows, look what he says. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. What is iniquity? Well, let's get that real quick. Let's get it real quick. Psalms 38 and verse 18. So a lot of brothers and sisters don't know what iniquity is, so let's clarify it. Psalms 38 and 18. For I will declare my iniquity... I will be sorry for my sin. You see that? Sin and iniquity is synonymous. They're one and the same. And as we went over earlier, what is sin? Breaking or transgressing God's holy law, statutes, and commandments. So let's go back to Amos. This is the book of Amos 3 and 2. One more time. It says, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities, for all your sin, for breaking my laws, what God is saying, what the Most High is saying, because we are his children. And any, any father or mother who has uh, uh, children, they understand the concept of discipline, okay? They understand that notion. When our children are disobedient, when they're acting up, when they're going off, we discipline them for their good. And this is the same thing the Most High is telling us. He said, therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Why? Because we are the people that he chose to be his children, to be the special people unto him. Verse 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? You see that? Remember, when we came out of the land of Egypt, Exodus 24, 3 through 7 again, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. That was the words that we said to the Most High God, to Moses, okay, to Moses to relay the message. We agreed to the covenant by our own confession, by our own oath, but then we broke it. That's why he says, can two walk together except they be agreed? We have to be on one accord with the Most High God and his son. We can't be walking left and the Lord is telling us to walk the straight and narrow. We can't be going right when the Most High through His Son is telling us to walk a straight and narrow. We got to go the right way, which is following the way, the truth, and the life, Hamashiach, Yahavashai. So let me get the book of Romans, chapter 5. It's the book of Romans, chapter 5, and I'm going to start at verse 8. And I'm going to read down to verse 11. Romans 5, 8 through 11. But, but God, but the Most High, commanded His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Hamashiach died for us. So the Lord is telling us through, through Apostle Paul here, says, while we were yet in our sin, the Most High sent his son to die for us while we were yet sinners. Verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved. See, there's that word saved, salvation, from wrath through him, remember the definition of salvation, to be saved from evil, danger, or harm. You see that? Let me read verse 9 again, Romans 5 and 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, through Christ's blood, Hamashiach Yahavashai, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Through who? Through his son, 
Yahawashai. And whose wrath? The Most High God. So it's, it's, it's Christ's blood that appeases, appeases the wrath of the Most High. Verse 10, Romans 5 and 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. You see that? So when Yahawashai died for us, we were brought back to the Father. Reconciliation means to once been cut off, but to be brought back. So let me read that again. For if when we were enemies, because when we went into sin, when we broke that contract, we became enemies to God. It says, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Do you see that? So through the blood of Christ, through the blood of Yahawashai, we are brought back to the Father. And because of his death, now we have an opportunity at salvation. Remember, we went off because the laws were given to us as a people. So we were the ones that needed redemption, saving. Verse 11, Romans 5 and 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord, Yahawashai Hamashiach, by whom we have now received the atonement. And that is very important, important because atonement, we're going to, we, like, actually, let me get that real quick. Let me get the definition of atonement real fast. Slock it. Bear with me, family. Get that real quick. Atonement, atonement. Okay, this is the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary definition of atonement. And it reads, to cover, counsel, satisfactory reparation for an offense or injury. You see that? So atonement means to be covered or counseled for an offense or injury. It says, that which produces reconciliation to be brought back. Uh, it says, in the Bible, it means the covering of man's sins through the shedding of, of blood. And it says, in the Old Testament, the blood of sacrificed animals. In the New Testament, the blood of man's Redeemer, Jesus Christ. So atonement, to cover for one's sins. So let's touch on that real quick. So I'm going to get the uh, book of Hebrews chapter 9 to expound on what this atonement is. Hebrews chapter 9. In verse 22 and it reads and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission meaning what unless there is bloodshed there is no forgiveness of the sins there is no atonement for the sins and in the scriptures the Most High has always mandated or instituted blood contracts even with marriage when a man first lays with a woman, it's called the tokens of virginity. A woman bleeds when she first, when a man first goes into her, when they have sexual relations for the first time. And that covenant is sealed. That's the contract. And it's the same way when we need atonement for our sin or forgiveness for our sin. The Bible says it, there's a requirement, which is the shedding of blood. So let me read that again. Hebrews 9 and 22. And almost all things are by the law. Purged with blood. Now the law, remember the law was given to Israel. It says, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So if there is no bloodshed, there is no forgiveness. This is what the Lord has instituted. And why is that? So let's get Leviticus 17 11. Why it's so important with the blood. This is the book of Le uh, Leviticus 17 and 11. And it reads, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. You see that? The life is in the blood. And it says, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls or forgiveness for your sins. This is what the Lord is telling us. It says, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Remission, atonement, forgiveness, all the same thing. So the Lord is saying, in order for there to be forgiveness of our sins, there has to be shedding of blood. And remember, what is sin again? 
It's transgression of God's laws. And who was the law given to? The children of Israel, the so-called black, Hispanic, and Native American. So let me get the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. And I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to read verse 1, then I'm going to jump down to verse 4 through 7. So this is Hebrews 10, verse 1. It says, for the law having a shadow of, of good things to come. Salaki, let me read that again. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So what is that saying? It's saying that we were making a mockery as a people. We were making a mockery of the, uh, of the atonement, the shedding of the blood of animals. That's what the Lord is telling us here. We did it yearly. So every time we would sin, we would just put up another turtle dove, another goat, another lamb, another bull. And we would go back to doing the same wicked stuff. So those, those blood sacrifices through the animals, it wasn't accomplishing much. We would get temporary forgiveness, but then we would go off again. That's why I said we had to do it year by year. So let's get verse 4. This is Hebrews 10 and verse 4. And it reads, Marie 4 through 7 says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away our take away sins. You see that? So here it is. The scriptures is letting us know that, yes, the Most High, he instituted a, 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 um, a way for us to be temporarily forgiven through the bloodshed of doves and goats and bulls and lambs, but it wasn't permanent. Cause why? Because we would continue in the same wicked habits. So it wasn't getting us nowhere. That's what the Lord is saying. It says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Verse 5, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared for me. Who is that talking about? Yahawashai, who is our perfect sacrifice. Verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, Thou has had no pleasure. You see that? The Most High wasn't pleased with us sacrificing bulls and goats. He wasn't pleased with that. Here, uh, verse 7, it says, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. And what is that going into? All, this, all the uh, animal sacrifice that our people had to do was just pointing to Christ, pointing to Yahawashai, a more perfect and better sacrifice. So let me read verse 6 one more time. It says, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. So let's, let's validate that further. So let me get the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22. This is 1 Samuel 15 and 22. It says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord have great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Remember, we just read that in Hebrews. It says he doesn't have uh, uh, pleasure and delight in, in sacrifices, the blood of animals. He didn't delight in that. Let me read this again. It says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord have great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? So he's, he's asking the question. Samuel's saying, Does the Most High prefer us to sacrifice animals, or does he prefer us to be obedient? He's asking the question. Okay? And look, he, he expounds further. It says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. You see that? That's, that's the whole message behind it, is obedience. But because our people are so wicked, the Most High gave us a plan. He gave us a, a he set up a system for us to be forgiven. Okay? Pointing to his son, to Hamashiach, Yahawashai. So let's go back to Hebrews. Go back to Hebrews, and I'm going to read chapter 9, 11 through 15. This is the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 11 through 15. It says, But Hamashiach, Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, 
he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. You see that? He was the perfect sacrifice that went into the holy of holies. This is why we honor the Feast of Tabernacles in remembrance of Yahawashai. You see that? It says, neither by the blood of the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. Once. When he got up on that cross and died for us, he sealed it for us. Okay? It says, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Forever. Okay? Eternal. To redeem the children of Israel through his sacrifice. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats in the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify up to the purine of the flesh. So here it is. He's saying if, if the blood of animals purified us for a time, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, of Hamashiach, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's heavy. I don't know if y'all understand that, but let me, let me explain this in layman terms if I can. So the Lord is telling us, he set up a system for when we sinned, he said, sacrifice turtle doves, bulls, goats, lambs to atone for our sins, to give us temporary forgiveness. But Christ was the much more better sacrifice without spot or blemish. And he atoned for our sins once and for all. So we don't have to continually do it year by year. He's the perfect sacrifice. Verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. That by means of death, by his death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. And who was under the First Covenant? We just touched on that. It was Joshua, the children of Israel, who the covenant was given to. So who has the opportunity at the new covenant? The same that was under the first covenant. This is what the Lord is saying. Let me read this again. Hebrews 9, verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator or the go-between, the, the atonement for us. This is what he's saying. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of, e of eternal inheritance. Going into what? The kingdom of heaven. That eternal life that is promised to those who love him. So the Mosai said that he bridged the gap, okay, with his son, with Hamashiach Yahawashai being the propitiation or the go-between, the mediator, the advocate for the children of Israel. He made a way for us to come to the Father to inherit eternal life through his bloodshed. Okay, so let's get First Chronicles because it says those that were under the first covenant. Okay, First Chronicles chapter 16 and I'm going to start at verse 13. This is First Chronicles 16, 13 through 17 and it reads... O ye seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, the word which he hath commanded to a thousand generations. Verse 16, key point. Even of the covenant which he made with Abraham. End of his oath unto Isaac. End have confirmed the same to Jacob for a law. End to Israel for an everlasting covenant. For how long? For an everlasting covenant. So let's go back to Hebrews 9 and 15 so you can understand. So, so the brothers and sisters can understand more clear now. Hebrews 9 and verse 15 one more time. And it reads... And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression, those who broke the laws, 
that were under the first testament. Who was under the first testament? What, what we just read, the children of Israel. So he said, I'm going to bring the ones that were in the first testament and bring them into the new. It's not for everybody. It always has been for the children of Israel. It says, they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. And just going to that called real quick, it says those who are called, just to validate that even further, Isaiah 43 and verse 1, it says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. You see that? It's dealing with the children of Israel from front to back. Redemption, salvation, forgiveness of sins, etc. is all for the children of Israel. So let me get the book of Sirach. Let me get the book of Sirach, also called Ecclesiasticus, chapter 17. And I'm going to start at verse 10, read down to 12. Sirach 17, 10 through 12, and it says, And the elect shall praise his holy name. Beside this he gave them knowledge in the law of life for an heritage. He made an everlasting covenant with them and showed them his judgment. You see that? The elect talking about the children of Israel. And we'll validate that as well. I'll validate that as well. So here's the book of Isaiah Pull that up real quick. Isaiah 45 and verse 4. And it reads, For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. So who are the elect? The children of Israel. It says, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. So let's go back to Sirach 17. Precept upon precept. We gotta prove these things because Christianity will have us to think that all people have a chance at the new covenant, at the promises. But that's not true. That's 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 unbiblical. Okay, that's not sound doctrine. So this is Sirach 17, 10 through 12, one more time. And the elect, the children of Israel, shall praise his holy name. Beside this, he gave them knowledge in the law of life for an heritage. He made an everlasting covenant with them. You see that? Not to everybody. With them. Very specific. The children of Israel. And showed them his judgments. So we got to quit thinking that Edom and Ishmael and Ammon and Ham, all these different nations can receive salvation. That's not what the scriptures are saying. It says he redeemed the children of Israel. Why? Because we broke the laws. So we need it. Uh, uh, atonement for our sins the ones that were under the first testament or covenant okay to be brought into the new okay that's what the lord is telling us the children of israel so let's go back to hebrews 9 i'm gonna read 14 and 15 one more time hebrews 9 14 and 15 so there's no confusion hebrews chapter 9 14 and 15 and it reads how much more shall the blood of Hamashiach, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You see that? He brought us from the ways of unrighteousness to the living God. Verse 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, by his death, for the redemption, for the bring, for the forgiveness, or the saving of, okay? It says, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. Who transgressed the law? Israel. Why? Because we were given the laws. So the, that is why we need redemption. And Yahawashai is our redeemer. It says, they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. So let me get the book of Matthew. Because dealing with that blood, it's not the blood of bulls and goats, but it's the blood of Christ. So everyone is talking about, um, um, the blood of Christ is on me. You got all these Christians saying that. So let's see. Matthew chapter 27. And I'm going to start at verse 22. Uh, and I'm going to read down to 25. Matthew 27, 22, 25. It says, Pilate saith unto them, 
What shall I do then with Yahawashai, which is called Hamashiach, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, let him be crucified. So here it is, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the leaders of Yasharala are delivering our Messiah up to be crucified by the Romans. Okay, so Pilate is asking the question, what, what should I do with him? And they say, crucify him. Verse 23, and the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, let him be crucified. Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, so the, the crowd was getting rambunctious. They were getting amped up. The leaders and the scribes, they were getting, you know, they were getting real serious about this. So he said, I got to do something. Pilate said, I got to do something now. It says, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Verse 25, key point. This is the key point. Matthew 27, verse 25. Then, I, then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us in our children. Meaning what? The children of Israel. Yes, the scribes and the Pharisees uh, delivered him up to Pilate. But they also had the understanding that his blood needed to be upon the children of Israel. He shed his blood for the so-called black, Hispanic, and Native Americans. Not the Romans, not the Edomites, the Ishmaelites, the Moabites, but for the children of Israel. Let me read 25 again. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. All praises to the Most High for that, because that's exactly why he sent his son to die for us. Is that So his blood would be upon us as his children. So let's get the book of John to validate this further, because there's a, a misconception out there. You know, with the Pharisees, that they didn't have the understanding, that they were just completely uh, off with their understanding. But let's see. This is the book of John 11, 49 through 52. Remember, it says, let his blood be upon us. This is what they said. Now look at what Caiaphas is saying in this passage. John 11, 49 through 52. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, ye know nothing at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people. So Caiaphas, he knew. He knew by the prophecies of old that the Messiah had to come and die for the children of Israel. So here it is. He's telling the people, look, y'all don't know. Okay? It is expedient. It's right. It's good for us that one man die for the people. And it goes on to say, and that the whole nation perish not. What nation? The nation of Israel. Why? Unless there's the remission of sin, the people are going to be destroyed. But because Christ shed his blood, now we have salvation through his sacrifice, through his shedding of blood. Let me read verse 50 again. Now remember, Caiaphas is speaking here. It says, now consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Verse 51 and this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yahweh should die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but that also he should gather together and won the children of God that were scattered abroad. And who were scattered abroad? Because some people will say, see, that, that's for everybody. No, let's get that. This is the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 1. James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Yahweh Hamashiach, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. So Caiaphas had the understanding that it, the one man, the Christ, the Messiah, had to die for the nation of Israel. And that's why he said, it is expedient that one man die for us, then the whole nation perish. You see, but a lot of people... Uh, give Caiaphas that that uh, that bad name, that misunderstanding that he didn't know. Yes, the Pharisees did a lot of wicked stuff. Okay, they were they were selfish. Okay, they they did a lot of things that were contrary to the spirit. But they did understand that the Messiah had to die for the nation of people. And this is why, 
Yahweh Shai said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Okay, and remember what the scripture says in James, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So if Yahweh Shai is asking the Father for forgiveness, pay attention. Okay, so the, uh, let me get the book of Matthew, chapter 1 and 21, because this one man dying for the nation. So what nation is this going into now? Matthew 1 and 21, who did Christ come and die for? I mean, we've already touched on it. Uh, uh, within a few precepts, he died for the children of Israel to redeem the ones that were in the first testament to bring them in into the new covenant, okay? Which we are currently not in, contrary to popular belief. The covenant has been sealed, but we haven't arrived yet, okay? So this is the book of Matthew 1 and 21. It reads, And she shall bring forth a son. Who's the she? Mary. It says, And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Yahawashai, for he shall save his people from their sins. Do you see that? It says save his people from their sins. To validate who his people is, let's get the book of 2 Samuel 7 and verse 24. This is the book of 2 Samuel 7 and 24. For thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. And thou, Lord, art become their God. So let me go back to Matthew. See that? Children of Israel is the Most High God's people. This is the book of Matthew 1 and 21, one more time. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahawashai, for he shall save his people from their sins. This say he's going to save all people. They say he's going to save Edom and Ishmael and Moab and Ammon and Ham. They say he's going to save his people, the children of Israel. So let's validate that even further. Let's get the book of Acts chapter 5, and I'm going to start at verse 30. Acts 5 and 30 through 31. The God of our fathers raised up Yahawashai. See right there. That's a cut on all these Christians. It said the God of our fathers. Okay. It says, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Talking about Christ. It says, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Why? Sin is a transgression of the law and the law was given to Israel. Let me read verse 31 again. Him have God exalted with his right hand, with his power, to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel. It didn't say everybody. It says to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You see that? So it's, it's clear. He didn't give salvation to everybody. He didn't give repentance and forg forgiveness of sins to everybody. Because not everybody received the, the Mosaic codified law. So this is the book of Acts, chapter 2, 21 through 22. It says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. But who is he talking to? Verse 22. Ye men of Israel. You see that? Cut. That cancels out all this nonsense. He didn't say ye men of all nations of Israel the inhabited earth he said ye men of israel whoever of the men the children of israel call upon the name of the lord shall be saved this is what the lord has said so let me get the book of acts chapter 3 22 and 23 and it says uh salakia acts 3 25 and 26 acts chapter 3 25 and 26 it says Ye are the children of the prophets. Who were the prophets? The Israelites. Predicated on Amos 2 and 11. God speaks to the children of Israel and makes them prophets. We start that over again. Acts 3, 25 and 26. Ye are the children of the prophets. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers. And we already touched on who the covenant was given to. It says, saying unto Abraham, And in, in, in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Meaning Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. It says, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Yahabashai, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And remember what iniquity is. 
In Psalms 38, 18, iniquity is sin. It's synonymous with sin. And once again, what is sin? Transgression of the law. And who was the law given to again? The children of Israel. It's clear as day. The reason why these people don't have the understanding is because they can't have the understanding. Let me get that real quick. Why these other nations, they think they got this book figured out, but they just don't. This is the book of Psalms 111 and verse 10. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. It says the good. How do we get that correct and good understanding? Is by keeping his commandments. And who was the commandments given to? To the children of Israel. So not everybody is going to have this understanding or, or get a vision or insight from the Lord. And let me, let me get that real quick. Amos 2 and 11. Because these churches are lying to us. The world has been lying to us. Amos 2 and 11. It says, And I raised up of your sons for prophets, and of your, and of your young men for Nazarites. It is not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord. You see that? So we got to understand who the Lord is dealing with. Amos 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealed his secret unto his servants, the prophets. His servants, the prophets, who are Israel. And we'll validate, it, validate that even further, who the servants are. Leviticus 25 and 55. And it reads, for unto, for unto me the children of Israel are my servants. Or Salakia. Leviticus 25, 55. One more time. For unto me the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So all these other nations, that's why he said earlier, what has thou to do to declare my statutes? Why are these other nations trying to take the word that was given to the children of Israel? And why are they using it? The Bible said it's not for them. Okay? It says, as for his judgments, they don't know them. Okay? Praise you the Lord. This is for the children of Israel. So we got to understand why these people are, are projecting this false doctrine, these false ideologies, okay? The incorrect understanding is because they don't have it. It's not in them to know it. It's a, it's a strong delusion. It's a strong delusion, and that's what it is. So let me get the book of Romans, chapter 10, and verse 1. This is the book of Romans 10 and 1, and it reads, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You see that? Paul didn't say, I want all people to be saved. He said, my heart's desire is for Israel, that they might be saved. The 12 tribes, you so-called black, Hispanic, and Native Americans. We got to get this thing right. We got to wake up as a people and turn back to the living God. We got to follow the way, the truth, and the life. We got to turn from our wicked ways and wake up as a people. Okay? Salvation is for the children of Israel. Why? Because we're the ones who need redemption. Not all these other nations need to be saved. We're the, we, the, we are the oppressed people, okay? We are the broken and contrite, okay? We are the ones subjugated to all these nations. We're the ones who need salvation. So let me get the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22 through 23. This is the book of Jeremiah chapter 3, 22 and 23. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal, heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. You see that? So the Lord is telling us through the prophet Jeremiah here. He's saying we must turn back to him. We got to quit backsliding. And he says, and I will heal your backsliding. Look at what verse 23 says, Jeremiah 3, 23. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills, meaning these other nations of people. It says, and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. There it is again. It's all through the scriptures. He's dealing with the children of Israel. That's why it says truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of the mountains. Meaning what? 
these other nations of people. That's what that's going into. It's talking about the nations on earth. Okay, so let's get uh, let's get the book of John three and sixteen now. That famous John three sixteen. This is the book of John chapter three and verse sixteen. It says, "For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish." but have everlasting life. So here it is. Christianity, they isolate this verse, and they say salvation is open to the inhabited earth, all families on earth. But that isn't sound doctrine. That is contrary to the word of God. So who is the world that it's talking to? Because it says, for God so loved the world. So let's get that. You know, touch on these classics. Isaiah 45 and verse 17. And it reads... But Israel, there is there it is again. Israel, Israel, Israel. Yasharala, Yasharala, Yasharala. It says, But Israel shall be saved. Salvation in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. There's your everlasting. It says, Ye shall not be ashamed, nor confounded. World without end. You see that? So the nation of Israel is its own world. It's a world without end. You see, so when people read John 3.16, for God so loved the world, they automatically equate that to all inhabitants of earth. But there's multiple worlds. You got Sea World. You got the world of sports. You got the world of medicine. You got all kind of worlds. But the Bible says that Israel is its own world. And uh, we're going to touch on that even further. So let's get the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. And I'm going to read one through two. It says, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, the children of Israel, verse two, key point, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. See, spoken to us. See, we got to understand who these letters, who these epistles were written to. Okay, They weren't written to all people on earth. It says, spoken to us, unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, plural. So there's multiple worlds. So we got to understand this thing. So let me get the book of Hebrews 11 and 3 to expand on this further. This is the book of Hebrews 11 and 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds, worlds, plural, were framed by the word of God. Talking about Yahweh It says, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You see that? So let's go back to John 3, 16. So there's no confusion there. So there's multiple worlds. And the scriptures let us know that Israel is its own world. John 3, 16. And we have to understand who the audience is that Yahweh Shai is speaking to. So I'm actually going to read verse 1. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. You see that? This is the audience that Yahweh Shai is talking to. Okay? John 3, 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting Life, And we know that's talking about the children of Israel being its own world. In the context of John 3.16, all you have to do is read John 3.14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is that going into? When Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the children of Israel were being bitten by snakes. And the Lord said, uh, set up a brass pole. When they look upon it, they shall be spared. They shall be saved. In the same way... That Yahweh was lifted up on that cross for the children of Israel. That if we look up, up to him and call upon him, we shall be saved. And that's all that is going into. So let me get the book of Acts chapter 13 and verse 26. This is the book of Acts 13 and 26. It says, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham... And whomsoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of, sal of this salvation sent. You see that? 
me read that again. It says, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of salvation sent. And who's the children? Isaac and Jacob, because Ishmael is the, is the, uh, the children of the flesh. So it's talking about the children of the promise, which was through Sarah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what that's going into. Okay, so let's get the book of John, because it says to them it is sent. It's not sent to everyone. So let's get the book of John 4 and 22. And it reads, Ye worship, ye know not what? We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Didn't say salvation is for everyone. It says salvation is for the Jews, is of the Jews. We, that's very critical. Now let's hear the words of Yahweh Shai. Matthew 15 and verse 24, and it reads, But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see that? Out of Christ's own mouth. He said, I didn't come for everybody. He called this woman a dog in this context. The, the disciples said, they begged him, get rid of her. Okay, she cried after us. And this woman was begging him. Yes, he healed her daughter. Okay, but that doesn't equate to salvation. And who's to say that this daughter, her daughter wasn't an Israelite? Just because she was a Phoenician woman, a woman of Canaan, that doesn't mean her daughter was. Why? Because the Bible says you are the seed of your father. And the scriptures doesn't clarify what this little girl was. She's the seed of her father, and her father very well could have been an Israelite. But we'll never know because it's not displayed in the scriptures. So some people, they read this context, and they jump over 24 through 26, and they go straight to say, Oh, see, see, he healed her daughter. And they equate that to salvation. No, that is a blessing that this woman received on earth. And that's it. People can be rewarded here for doing good deeds. Okay? You see that all the time. But salvation is for the children of Israel. So Matthew 15 and 24 again, it says, But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that's what the Lord said he's dealing with. That's who he's dealing with is the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So let me get the book of John. Go back to John 4, uh, 23 through 24. And it reads, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We got to understand this thing. So the Lord said, the true worshiper has got to stand up. We got to worship him in spirit and in truth. So let's touch on the spirit. So this is the book of John, chapter 6, verse 63. And it reads, it is the spirit that quickeneth. It's the spirit that makes us alive. It says, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you. They are spirit and they are life. So what is the spirit? The word of the living God. Okay? Yahweh, the word, is the spirit. It said, is the spirit that quick? It's the spirit that makes us alive. Okay? We can't be made alive without the word. That's the only way. So it says we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So let's touch on the truth now. So it's all dealing with the word. And who's the word? Yahweh. Psalms 119 and 142. This is why Yahweh Shai said he comes in the volume of the book. It is written of him. He's the word. He's the living word. So Psalms 119, 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. In thy law is the truth. So worshiping him in spirit and in truth, that's what he's seeking for us to do. That's what he's requiring us to do is to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, the Word of God. And the truth is the law, statutes, and commandments. And that is what the Bible is saying. So we got to believe on this thing. So, uh, let's, so let's get that real quick. And actually, um, let's get that about belief. So Rock 32 and verse 24. So a lot of people say they believe God, but 
Here it is. Remember, it says, those who believe on him shall have eternal life. So, Sirach 32 and 24 says, He that believeth in the Lord, take if heed to the commandment. And he that trusteth in him shall fare never the worse. You can't go wrong with trusting in the Lord. We got to trust in the Lord. And it says, if we believe in him, we're going we're gonna to keep the commandments of God. Like it says in 1 John 2 and 3, For he who says he knows him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So we have to keep the law, statutes, and commandments in the faith. That is what's required of us. So let me get the book of Proverbs 28 and verse 18. This is the book of Proverbs 28, 18. It says, Whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved. You see that? Walking uprightly. We've got to be righteous in this thing. It says, But he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. So if we walk uprightly in righteousness, the Bible says we shall be saved. So some of you might not know what righteousness is. So let's touch on that real quick. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 25. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. And remember, the law was given to Yasharalim. Okay, this is what's going to get us in the correct relationship with the Lord. He's telling us that we have to be obedient to his voice, okay? This is the only way, okay? So Matthew 19, see what Christ said, what Yahweh Shai said. Matthew 19 and verse 16. It says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? You see, that's the grand question. That's what we should all be asking for. What can we do to inherit the kingdom of heaven, to inherit eternal life? Verse 17, And he saith unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God, Yahweh, the Father in heaven. Look what he goes on to say. But if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. There it is. Red letter, plain as day. He said we have to keep the commandments. Christianity would say, oh, all you got to say is I believe on Christ. Say some words. Do the worm on the floor. Shake like doing the Harlem shake. And you're going to get into the kingdom of heaven. Speaking some, some weird tongue. No. The Bible says we got to keep the law, statutes, and commandments in the faith. That's how we're going to inherit eternal life. Everyone ain't going to make it doing this. Okay? So let's get this, John 14 and 6. We got to listen to what the Lord is telling us. This is John 14 and 6. It says, Yahweh Shai saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We got to follow him. We got to listen to him. He sent his son to be the propitiation, the mediator, the go-between, the advocate for us as his children. So we can't neglect the free gift of salvation through the blood of his son, through his sacrifice. Let me get the book of John, chapter 10, 1 through 4, and it reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. So he's telling us, Shehawah I said, if you try to get into the kingdom any other way than him, because he's the door. He said, you are a thief and a robber. Verse 2. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The shepherd of the sheep. You see that? So we got to see who that sheep is. Remember, he said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That is the sheep. It says, verse 3. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. You see that? So the Lord is telling us. He said, my sheep are going to hear my voice. So to validate that even further, who the sheep are, Jeremiah 50 and verse 6, and it reads, My people, remember who his people are, the children of Israel. He said, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill 
They have forgotten their resting place. And where is their resting place? The word of God. The law, statutes, and commandments. we got to understand what the Lord is telling us. We, our people have been going from mountain to mountain to hill to hill, nation to nation to authority to authority to government to government to religion to religion. All this folly. we got to stay in the resting place. we got to abide in the love of the Lord. He said, abide in me and I in you. Okay, we got to stay connected to the vine. We are the branches, okay? So we got to understand this thing. He said his sheep are going to hear his voice. We got to follow him. Okay, so Matthew 16. Let me pull that up real quick. Because we do got to follow him. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. It says, Then said Yahweh Shai unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You see that? So we got to give up some things. He said we got to take up our cross. We got to bear that cross. Not wear it. We got to bear the cross and follow him. We got to walk that straight and narrow that he said, okay? So we don't want to step to the left. We don't want to step to the right. We want to follow the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, if anyone is trying to save their life, they want to get that bag. They want to go sell dope. They want to work on the Sabbath, okay? They want to eat abominable foods. They want to fornicate. They want to not keep the high holy days. They want to do these things. If they're trying to save their own life, committing all these uh, abominations, it says they're going to lose their life. But the one who loses his life for his sake shall find his, find his life. Meaning what? If we're willing to sacrifice the things of this world, that is what we have to do, Yasharala, to inherit eternal life. So let me get the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 17. Because a lot of people, um, you got a lot of people saying on one end, you just got to keep the laws and don't have faith in Christ. And you got the other end of people saying, you just got to believe on Christ and not keep the laws. But let's see. James 2 and verse 17, and it reads, Even so, if it hath not, or Salakia, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Meaning what? We got to have the faith in the works. We got to believe on the Messiah, and we have to be obedient. That's why he said, come and follow me. It's twofold. They go together like peanut butter and jelly. You can't have one without the other. You got to believe and keep the commandments. Like it said in Sirach 32 and 24, if, he, if we believe, we're going to take hold of the commandments of God. And that is what we must do. So let me get the book of 1 John, chapter 5. 1 John, chapter 5, and I'm going to read 9 through 12. And it reads, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So the Most High is letting us know. He said, look, the only way we're going to get in is through the door. And who is that? Yahawashah, Hamashiach, the anointed one, our Savior, our Redeemer, who put his body on that cross and died for us, who shed that blood for us. And that's why the Bible says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If we just mock uh, the Lord's uh, a sacrifice, okay? That's wicked. The, the Most High has, has get, given us such a Blessed gift through his son for us to receive eternal life. Why wouldn't we want that? So we got to understand this thing. Believe on the record of his son like the scriptures is telling us to. So let me get the book of Revelation 14 verse 12. Revelation 14 and 12 it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Yahweh, the last book of the Bible. It says, here's the patience of the saints. And we know the saints is Yasharala, 
predicated on Psalms 15.5 and Psalms 148.14. Okay? So it said that we have to be patient in this thing and keep the commandments in the faith that go together. Like James said, faith without works is dead. So Revelation 22.14, the last book, the last chapter in the book. Revelation 22 and 14, and it reads, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. You see, that's how we're going to get our pass in. we got to be obedient to the voice of the Lord. Now, we got to use common sense here. Now, which one of us would let a murderer, a rapist, or a thief into our house? See, that don't even make sense. So the Lord is telling us, look, if we're going to come into his house, into the kingdom, we got to be obedient. We have to listen to what he's telling us. we got to be in that relationship with him. Okay? So let me get the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24, and verse 13. This is the book of Matthew 24, verse 13. It says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Because Christianity will have you to think that we saved already. What are we saved from? Okay? We still go through ailments. We still go through problems. We still are oppressed. We still are subjugated to our oppressor. Okay? What are we saved from right now? It has been sealed, the new covenant, but we haven't arrived yet. That's why he said, but he that shall endure unto the end. We aren't at the end yet. It says the same shall be saved. Okay? That is what we're hoping on. That is the faith of the... The patience of the saints. We got to be patient in this thing. We are not saved yet. Yahweh Shai sealed the new covenant with his blood, but we haven't arrived. We are waiting patiently and faithfully for that day to come. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 10 and 12. This is the book of 2 Corinthians 10 and 12. It says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number. Or compare ourselves with the same, some that compare, commend themselves. Like, let me start over. 2 Corinthians 10 and 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number. See, we don't want to count ourselves already in that number. Okay, we, we don't know. We're hoping and praying. It says, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. It's kind of a tongue twister. But it's basically saying, look, if you're already counting yourself in, you really think that you got that free pass into heaven, to the kingdom. It says you aren't wise. We don't know. We can't, we can't say for sure. Only the Most High God knows who's coming in. We don't know for sure. We'll know on that day when he sends his son to redeem the children of Israel. But we got to do some things. We got to keep the faith in the works. Romans 13 and 11. Remember, he said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Romans 13 and 11. And it reads, in that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. You see that? So Paul is letting it be known. He said our salvation was near, but hasn't came yet. So we got to awake out of this sleep. We can't have that mindset that, we already in. That is why these Christians are going off. Okay? They think that they sanctified and full of the Holy Ghost. They go to church and dip, get dipped in that water, and the next week they snort cocaine, sleep around with their brother's wife, okay? Throwing up gang signs, and then Easter Sunday comes around, they back at the church thinking that they sanctified full with the Holy Ghost again. Thinking that their name is already recorded in heaven as for salvation purposes. No. The Bible says we must endure to the end. Okay, let me read 11 again. Romans 13, 11, it says, In that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. See that? We got to awake. We got to open up our spiritual eyes and ears and realize that the time is drawing near. This was written 2,000 years ago. How much closer are we now to the day when the Most High is going to send His Son? So Philippians... Philippians, pull that up real quick. Philippians 3, 12 through 14. This is the book of Philippians 3, 12 through 14. It says, look what Paul said. And remember, we don't want to count ourselves in that number because we don't know yet. We just hope and pray that we are part of the elect or at least the great multitude. So Philippians 3, it says, starting at 12, 
not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Hamashiach Yehoshua. So, so Paul is saying, look, I, I haven't arrived to that point yet. I, 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 I'd like to be that, but I'm not there yet. Okay, I'm trying to take hold of Hamashiach as much as I can, but I'm not quite to that perfection level that I'm striving to be. Verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. You see that Paul said, look, I'm not, I haven't got to the point of salvation yet, but tell you what, I'm not going to look in the rearview mirror. I'm not going to focus on the things behind me. I'm going to press forward. I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on the prize that lies ahead. Once you start the race, we got to continue. We don't want to stop in the race. What racer? Racer stops in the middle of a race, jumps over one hurdle, then jumps over two hurdles, and then just gives up. No, that's not how we got to do things. We got to be, we got to press forward all the way to the end. That's why I said, he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. But you can't be that runner that, that, that quits halfway through the race. And see, one thing about racing, one thing about a marathon or, 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 or a track, uh, track meet or whatever, um, it gets harder as you go. You get more tired. You get more thirsty, exhausted, fatigued. But it's more important than ever to push through, okay? You don't give up halfway through. We, we, we don't want to be those people that start and then and then draw back, okay? Once we put our hands to the, to the plow, we must do, continue to do the work. We must finish, okay? We don't want to look back. We gotta, even if we got to crawl, if we got to crawl to the finish line. It's better to finish than, than to turn around and give up. So verse 14, Philippians 3, 14, it says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Hamashiach Yehoshua. You see that? So Paul said, look, I know I haven't arrived yet. I don't claim to arrive yet, okay? But what I'm not going to do is look behind me. I'm going to keep going to the finish line. And that's the mindset, the attitude that we all must have. So Romans 10, let me get the book, book of Romans. Salakia, Salakia, Salakia. Romans 10, uh, I'm going to read 6 through 9. This is the book of Romans 10. Uh, verse 6 through 9, it says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? You see, we shouldn't be saying, Is this person going to go? Is that person going to go? Yes, we got to examine ourselves, but we don't know. Only the Lord knows. It says, That is to bring Christ down from above. Verse 7, Or who shall descend into the deep? We don't want to be saying that such and such is going to burn. Such and such going to hell. You know, that's all Christianity rhetoric. Okay? The Most High has a plan with all that. What we need to do is stay in the faith and keep the commandments of God. Mary verse 7 again, it says, or who, shall descend in, or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the deep. Verse 8, But what saith it? The word, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. we got to be faithful in this thing. we got to believe on Hamashiach Yehoshua. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Yehoshua, and shalt believe in thine heart, thy mind, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Let me read verse 9 again. It says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Yehoshua, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You remember, Sirach 32 and 24, if we believe, we're going to take heed to the commandments. We're going to be obedient. Like James said, faith in the works. We've got to do both. They go together. Okay? So let me get the book of Romans 8. And I'm going to start at verse 22. This is the book of Romans 8, uh, verse 22 to 25. It says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they... But ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. I like that word adoption. It says, to wit, the redemption of our body. We're looking for that redemption. Verse 24, it says, for we are saved by hope. The hope that is seen is not hope. 
So what is he saying? What's Paul saying? If you already, if you can see uh, uh, what it is you're hoping for, it's not really truly hope. That is why we're hoping for the kingdom of heaven, the arrival of Yahweh Shai and the chariots of God to deliver us out of this captivity, out of this hell that we're in right now. I'm going to read verse uh, 24 again. It says, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why do if he yet hope for? So he's saying, look, if, if, if it's already in front of you, why are you hoping for it? You don't hope for what you already have. So we're hoping for the kingdom to come. Verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for him. This is why in Revelation it says the, the saints are faithfully and patiently waiting. And that's why we must wait, and we got to endure until the end. We are not saved yet, but we are hoping for that. So, remember, the adoption. So, who's the adoption for? And here, this is the book of Romans, chapter 9, 1 through 4. It says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I wish... For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. You see that Paul said, I wish I could have died for my brothers like Christ. And I, I wish I could have did it. You know, this is what Paul is saying. So he's saying, my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption. The adoption pertains to Israel. In the glory, the glory pertains to Israel, the kingdom of heaven. It says, in the covenant, the old and the new pertains to Israel. In the giving of the law, the law, statutes, and commandments pertain to Israel. It says, in the service service of God, as it says in Leviticus 25, 55, the ser his servants are Israel. It says, in the promises, all the promises from front to back. From Genesis to Revelation, all pertain to the nation of Israel. So let's get the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 68 through 71. This is the book of Luke chapter 1, 68 through 71. It says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. You see that? Of Israel. For he hath visited and redeemed his people. You see that? It didn't say all people. It said redeemed his people. Verse 69. In hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Verse 71, key point, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. You see that? That is what salvation is going to be, to be delivered from this wicked kingdom, from our enemies. From all the oppressors that raped, robbed, and murdered us century after century, millennium after millennium. And from all that hate us. Okay? This is what the Lord said. He's delivering us from. Not everybody is oppressed. Not everybody went into slavery. Okay? This is for the children of Israel. You so-called black, Hispanic, and Native Americans. So let me get the book of 2 Ezra, chapter 8. And I'm going to read verse 3. This is 2 Ezra, chapter 8 and 3. It says... There be many created, but few shall be saved. You see that? Few shall be saved. Contrary to popular belief, Christianity in the world would have you to think that Christ has died for everybody. That's not true. The Bible says that he came for Israel and Israel only. It says few shall be saved. So let me get to uh, verse 40 and 41. Second Ezra chapter 8, 40 and 41. It says... Like as I have spoken now, so shall it come to pass. For as the husbandman soweth much seed upon the ground, and planted many trees, and yet the thing that is sown good in his season cometh not up, neither doeth all that is planted take root. It's talking about people here. People are compared to trees and seeds. It says, even so is it of them that are sown in the world. They shall not all be saved. Let me read that last part again. They shall not all be saved. You see that? So we got to understand this thing. It's not for everybody. 
This is for the righteous elect of God and the great multitude, the children of Israel. It says a lot of people are planted in this world, but not everybody is going to be saved. So now I'm going to close with the book of Zechariah. This is the book of Zechariah uh, 13. I'm going to read 8 and 9. We'll close with this. It says, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, say, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. So here it is. The Lord is telling us that two-thirds of God's own people, the children of Israel, are going to be cut off and die. Why? Because they don't want to repent. They want to stay wicked. They want to keep committing uh, adultery and fornicating. They want to keep uh, uh, using drugs and, 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 and lying and stealing, gangbanging. They want to keep worshiping Christmas and, and uh, Easter, all these abominations, birthdays and anniversaries, all, these, all this idolatry. They don't want to worship the true living God and his son, Yahweh. So what, what's going to happen? The Lord said two-thirds of them are going to be cut off and die. Verse 9, uh, or Salaki, it says, But the third shall be left therein, but one-third is going to be left, saved from the destruction, the ICBM missiles. So we got to understand this thing. This is what we're faithfully and patiently waiting for, hoping to be part of that great elector, the multitude. Verse 9, and I will bring the third part through the fire. What fire? The missiles. It says, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. Remember, we're comparable to precious gold, the scriptures say. It says, they shall call on my name, and I will hear, hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. You see that, Yasharala? So this is what we're hoping for. That is what salvation is. It's not open to all inhabitants of the earth. It is directly to the children of Israel uniquely. Um, and this is what the scriptures say. So if anybody is going contrary to, to the scriptures, that's unsound. Uh, we got to listen to what thus saith the Lord. And the Lord is telling us one third is going to be spared. So, you know, that's what salvation is. It's for the children of Israel. Uh, like Jeremiah said, truly in vain is salvation hoped for from these other nations. This word is for you so-called black, Hispanic, Native Americans. And we got to wake up and realize who the Lord is dealing with. Remember, he said, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. So we got to repent as a nation. we got to keep the faith in Hamashiach, Yahushai, the son of the Most High, and, uh, and keep the commandments of God. Uh, and with that, I, like, I hope the, the brothers and sisters are edified. That's the parameter of salvation, who it's for, what it's about. Uh, so I'd like to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahashem, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, Kwam Yasharala.